Um, I think you all know about um, a little bit about Joy from uh, background materials in, in, in your board in your um, book. Um, I'm going to start with kind of both the most obvious and the most stupid question I could ask because I think this is the best job in the world. But why would you want this job? <laughs> Welcome, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. Uh, if I can answer by way of, of a citation of a quote, of a, of a poem, too, because everyone, that seems to have been the, the, the tradition so far in the meeting. Um, in my mind, looking out at all of you is, uh, and, and thinking about the societies you represent and the research you represent, is, uh, in, my, in my mind, are, are running some lines by uh, a poet, I'm, I'm sorry to say, probably not as well known to you as he, as he should be, Dionysius Periagetes. He's a um, early second century <laughs> CE. I'm a classicist, I'm sorry. Um, but he's a, he's a North African probably early second century CE poet, and he wrote a, a poem that had an amazing afterlife in, uh, in the early modern period and into the 17th and 18th century, a description of the world and in, in, in poetry. And he says about 115 lines in that he's never been to any of the places he's describing, but the power of words allows him to convey that knowledge. You know, it's the muse, it's the, uh, the power of of language to animate the imagination that lets him communicate thick descriptions uh, of, of regions of the world he has never seen and will never see himself in person. So this is very much in my mind a capacity of humanistic research to take us out of ourselves, to uh, allow us to communicate about and to other people whom we will never see in person, or these days we may, uh, because of the capacity of travel, but with whom we need to connect through through language and through different languages. Um, so that I hope captures in a you know by metonymy uh, many many bounces of the ball, but uh, I hope connects or begins to answer your question um, because the research again the scholarship you all represent and advocate for and support in societies and in universities. Um, this with, without this. Uh, as you said of Sandra, you know, nothing will happen in the world. No change, no self-awareness, no self-knowledge, um, no creativity, no ways to think about the world being a better place. So all the things we do, um, all the things you do, but I think I'm beginning to say we now. Um, that's Good. What, that's what brings me here. Yeah. That's Thank you. Here. So speaking of universities, you've had recently um, experience at two great universities in New York City, right? You, she's now, Joy is now interim president and has been provost at the uh, CUNY Graduate Center, and before that she was uh, dean for the humanities at NYU. So what has that taught you about higher education, the experience at these two very different places, but um, similar in lots of ways too, I imagine? Yeah, similar in some ways. I think. It, the, uh, most recently, the move to, to CUNY, to the, to the Graduate Center, uh, I, I've learned more about the amazing scope of higher education in the U.S. by moving there. And of course, in my time at NYU, uh, I was Dean for the Humanities just at the moment where we were uh, not opening, those they had opened, but, uh, but we were staffing up and putting together the governance and the curriculum for NYU's two global campuses in Abu Dhabi and Shanghai. So I had a really interesting glimpse into what it meant to try to uh, transplant, transport American liberal, liberal arts education to very different regions of the world in those, in those, uh, uh, those two countries. But then moving to, to CUNY, I mean the Graduate Center, <laughs> I won't try to explain the structure of the City <laughs> University of New York to you because it would take all morning, but. Um, but essentially, it, you know, the, it's CUNY is a, it's a consortium of 25 colleges, community colleges and, and, uh, and senior colleges, as they're called, four-year institutions, and graduate and professional schools. And the Graduate Center sits at the hub of these, and our doctoral students, of whom there are about 3,200, teach uh, in most of the CUNY colleges around the city. They teach an astonishing number of 170,000 undergraduates a year. So, that means they're bringing back to the Graduate Center that experience. And the CUNY undergraduate body, to give you another number, 
is about 40% of CUNY undergraduates come from households in New York that make under $30,000 a year. So it's a, it's a university of, of students who are ambitious, incredibly talented, but who have immense socioeconomic obstacles to overcome. Uh, and I'd, you know, never, I'd never been part of a university that had at the core of its mission the work of educating, not those students who are you know, at elite colleges and universities who have crossed every T and dotted every I and put together great application files and, and gotten into great universities, but students uh, who are going to do great things in their lives but have a lot, of, a lot to learn to get there. So that really changed my, um, I mean, I could have, going back to Dionysius, I could imagine, and I did imagine, the power of education to transform people's lives before I got to the Graduate Center, but I actually experienced and saw firsthand uh, that impact once I, got, once I got to CUNY. Has that given you ideas for <laughs> what ACLS might want to be thinking about over the next few years? Yeah, absolutely, and one of the, uh, one of the things I learned through, well, I'll just mention two things. Uh, one thing I, I, one lesson I think I'll carry for me forever is uh, or a set of lessons uh, from my colleagues at LaGuardia Community College, which thanks to the generosity of the Mellon Foundation, uh, works in a partnership, a collaboration with the Graduate Center. We, we send about 10 graduate students, well now 20 graduate students a year to work at LaGuardia, work with master teachers, and teach in the humanities and mentor humanities scholars, un undergrads at, the, at LaGuardia Community College. And my colleagues both in the administration and in the faculty at LaGuardia uh, help me see the, the internal hierarchies that structure uh, our fields and, and that make life, uh, can make life uh, for faculty at community colleges difficult and painful. Um, there's a lot of exclusion that goes on, including at the annual meetings. There's a fair amount of disrespect that they feel, um, a lot of hurt, uh, sense that they've landed at community colleges and once having done so, they're looked on at or looked at by, um, by colleagues at other, other types of universities as, as just teachers. Uh, and so that, that has been really illuminating for me to think about how, uh, given especially the fact that I'm sure you all know that of all the sectors in American higher education, the sector where humanities enrollments and majors are actually growing is in community colleges. That's where students are, are being set on fire by the love for text, love for history, studying communications, media, cinema, philosophy, uh, art, uh, the visual arts, the performing arts. So given that fact and uh, put that next to the sense of distance um, that, um, or, and the sense of, as I said, it's a painful word, but it, it needs to be said out loud, the sense of disrespect that community college, uh, college faculty can feel um, especially in professional societies, especially e even despite our best efforts, you know, to, to be inclusive. We have more thinking to do, I think, on that front. Um, and that leads me to the fellowship programs. Uh, it's, it seems to me that, and, and you've started this work already, that when we seek to support the research of faculty and graduate students who are working in communities and contexts different from uh, well-resourced colleges and, and universities, we have some thinking to do about how best to, uh, how best to support them. Uh, not, uh, perhaps not uh, the, the conventional way with semester or year-long fellowships, perhaps in more creative ways. So that's one of the, one of the issues I wanna talk with you about, uh, what you've learned in your travels and uh, your contacts with people so that we can target and, uh, and shape our support so it does the most good. So stay tuned. Um, I, I do want to give um, you a chance to ask some questions. I have more, but, I, but we, this is your opportunity. We have people, I think, with microphones? Yeah. yeah okay, great, all right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Warren Hoffman. I'm the executive director at the Association for Jewish Studies. Welcome. We're so glad to have you as the new head of the organization. Thank you. Um, one thing that I know that we're talking about at the AJS and that other colleagues, and I think we're hearing this already through ACLS, is that as um, academics are looking to better engage with the public humanities and play a role in those fields, one thing that we're recognizing is that they don't always actually have the skills to, to do some of that. And with all the, the attention on, on pedagogy but all, and, and the research fellowships, 
What role do you see potentially ACLS playing in, in having this new generation of scholars really have the skills to engage with um, lay audiences, mainstream media sources, um, because of their, th there's actually a wide gap that I think needs to be um, uh, uh, met. Yeah, that's a great question. The, um, and, and I think when you say skills, I actually think of two different types of skills. Uh, I remember as a graduate student in classical studies at Penn uh, some, some years ago now, we, we felt overwhelmed by the demands on us. Not only did we have to learn Latin and Greek, we had to learn some Greek and Roman history, archaeology, material culture, some art history, uh, theory, cultural studies. You know, the list kept getting longer and longer. And, and the list is only longer now for, um, and, and everyone can mutatis mutandis, you know, fill in the list of, uh, of categories of areas that they, that you all had to study uh, and, and that your colleagues had to master. So added to that, to that list at the top of my thinking is, are the skills that, uh, are, are both the skills you alluded to as necessary to impart somehow to, uh, to graduate students, doctoral students, and, and faculty at different stages of their careers. But I want to add another skill set, too, and that's the kind of going back to my own experience, thinking about the challenges of, of learning languages and, and history. We're, we're in a world now, too, that's so diverse and, and, uh, and invites, as it should, as it must, as, as we must, invite an increasingly diverse group of people into graduate school and into the professoriate. Um, and we can't, uh, in my view, uh, stick to the traditional, uh, say, barriers or hoops that we used to expect people to jump through, um, not even just in college, but in my own field, experience in Latin and Greek going back to high school used to be not, a, not an absolute requirement, but in the back of everyone's mind as a very good thing. Well, we don't live in that kind of world anymore. You know, we live in a world where um, if, we, if we're going to limit the entryways into our fields uh, with, you know, by, by alluding to experiences or requiring experiences that are only available to a small number of people in this country or around the world, you know, we're not going to get the best brains. We're not going to get the most uh, creative and uh, insightful thinkers. So, so I think when I, when I think about your question, we have even double the work to do because we need to think creatively not, a, not only about how we can learn from journalists and learn from those amazing people doing podcasts and reaching out to audiences through digital means, uh, whether they're inside or outside the academy, and I believe we can impart those skills, but we also need to think creatively about how to teach uh, foundational skills to, p to students who are more advanced in their careers, you know, so doctoral students who may want to study uh, German literature but don't discover the Department of German until their junior year in college. And so we have to find ways to, uh, to learn serious language pedagogy so that we can train 22 and 23 and 25 year olds or 30 or 35 or 40 or beyond year olds uh, to learn languages, to learn foundational skills that make uh, foundational, advanced, world-changing research possible. Great, thank you. Another question. Yes. I wonder if the ACLS has thought about combining training for communication to a wider public with some of the grant programs that we have so that we are learning and our younger people learning not only those hard skills that absolutely, as you say, are essential and they are not going to be learned in high school anymore, but at 20, at 30, but also how to communicate the value of these things to a wider community without it becoming superficial or distorted. And since there are programs for the natural scientists, uh, couldn't we look into similar programs for humanists because we're supposed to work with words, but our words often don't reach wider parts of society? We, we actually, uh, this, this may be a question, since you asked it about the past tense, so I can, re um, and I'm the past. I can, I can. No, we actually have thought about this, um, and I, I remember when we were, um, brainstorming about what kinds of things we should ask um, uh, help for in our campaign. One idea was to somehow have uh, as a you know, prayer supplement to a fellowship stipend uh, support for precisely the kind of 
uh, training that, that you're um, talking about. I know that many of our residential research centers do this for their fellows and residents, and that's a somewhat easier task because the people are there all at the same time. But, um, you know, this is an idea that um, whose time has come, cl clearly, and um, whether that's something that, you know, could be implemented um, going forward in, in some manageable ways, I is, I, you know, I think it sh certainly should be discussed. Yeah, agreed. And, uh, and I, I have a kind of cardinal rule when it comes to, <laughs> to issues like this, and that is we, we need to think about how to do this without adding on. Um, I, I think about this a lot at the Graduate Center where, where you know, to, uh, to, to imagine yourself again as a graduate student, you've got all these exams in front of you, you've got a dissertation to think about, you've got your teaching to do, family maybe to worry about, and, uh, and then you're told, oh, public, public skills, communication, come to this workshop, come to this extra thing, come to this evening event, come to this weekend, you know, give up a Saturday, uh, that Saturday that you've probably set aside, you know, for cr crucial work on your dissertation proposal. So how do we move away from the thinking about add-ons and extras and actually and embed this training into the way we teach doctoral students and, and undergraduates as well, but especially thinking about the next generation of researchers and scholars and academics, how do we take those things that we, we know are crucial for the survival of our fields and, and bring them, make them core to the way we teach doctoral seminars? So it's another area to think about, about how to fund and how to, how to, um, how to encourage uh, creative thinking that's already going on you know, every, in, in many, many places uh, about uh, in conveying these skills in the context of core doctoral seminars. Thank you. Any other ideas for? Um for Joy to be thinking about as she, um, <laughs> as she moves toward next year. I see it. Okay. Uh, Stephen Hartnett from the National Communication Association. Uh, we stand at the ready to offer you our skills <laughs> <laughs> for doing public speaking and making blogs and making videos. So maybe we could talk about how to do that. But my question for you is that we live in a cultural moment where a fair number of our neighbors seem to believe that the earth is flat and up is down and pigs can fly. So my question for you is, what are your thoughts on how the ACLS might help us as individual scholars and representatives of our organizations? How might we all be better advocates for higher education? That's a great question and crucial question and can, it picks up a thread from earlier ones as well. And w one of the things that, that ACLS already does and, and, and I think bears thinking about how to enhance and, and enrich is serving as a clearinghouse for ideas so that individual societies and individual scholars aren't reinventing the wheel. Um, I'm sure we all hear this, especially in an age of email, that we're in an age where um, a lot of administrative work has been put onto the shoulders of individual faculty and departments because of streamlining of, um, of services by universities that are, that are under financial pressure, that there's just not enough time. And uh, so that sense that there's not enough time in the day to do all the things that, that faculty, researchers, students want to do, combined with the challenge of, these, of, a, of a rapidly changing world, especially when it comes to modes of communication, digital and otherwise, uh, we, we need to be ever more vigilant to avoid putting people in the situation where they're figuring out answers to these questions themselves and then finding out later, oh, what, what I could have learned if I'd only looked at that right website, you know, that, that website or met that person or um, had that conversation. So the more, the, the more ACLS can do in making easily accessible through, through clear labeling of topics, through discussions, um, sharing ideas, pulling them together, uh, and, and uh, making them le legible to people at different stages of, c of career, the better. Okay, uh, one, another question? Thanks, hi, I'm Monica Heller, I'm the delegate for the American Anthropological Association. So increasingly, we're representing a membership which is employed not in the academy. There's, I mean, there's the whole issue of the precariat, which, we, which is one set of issues. But there's the other set of issues which has to do with the numbers of different ways in which the humanities are finding modes of, of expression in life in all kinds of areas. And so we still seem to be focused a lot on the university career, the university as the sort of site of knowledge production. I was wondering whether you have any thoughts about the increasing numbers of our members who are doing other things. 
Many. Um, I'll mention just a couple thoughts, and, and one goes back to the site of the annual meeting and the role of the society and being in, in, in encouraging not just faculty but and, and not just uh, people who have academic positions, but those who are working outside the academy in the spaces you're talking about, to, to give them a space to come together, to work with other scholars, to, to reconnect, to re-energize, re uh, and, and really to think carefully, starting by talking with these people and asking what works for them, um, not just having a reception for independent scholars at, at annual meetings, which is something we started to do in my own field um, some years ago, and that was okay, that was a step, but, but there's more to do, again, to, to embed and integrate uh, people working outside the traditional spaces of humanistic research through the annual meeting. Um, another, uh, our, uh, an, another kind of approach to this, a way to tackle it, is to uh, encourage way, faculty who do have traditional appointments to, to look up and out of the university context or the college context in which they're working and make connections with high school teachers, with people working locally um, as independent researchers, and, and break down a little bit of the wall that tends to accrete uh, between the university college space and the world outside um, and creating more of a flow. Uh, one, one area that I think is really most easy, or one way most easy to do this is to uh, keep track of those PhDs who go on to work outside the academy and who still have a, uh, an organic connection with their quote unquote home department where they got their PhD. Um, rather than uh, let them drop off our websites and, and go off into the great unknown and pursue great careers in, in NGOs or in law or in business or media, what have you, um, being just as proud of those people and listing their accomplishments on, on websites, inviting them back to speak to undergraduates and graduates, just creating more of a flow uh, for people who want to sustain a rich thread of, the, of scholarly work either as their paid work outside the academy or not, and, and keeping them engaged. I think it will revitalize our thinking and, and keep us, uh, those of us in, in the more traditional spaces of humanistic research, better connected to flows of thinking and, and, and new developments in the world. Okay, well, Joy's gonna be here for the rest of the day, and so you're gonna have a lot of opportunity to pepper her with ideas. Um, I've already told you what a great crowd this is you can see what a great president you're going to have, and you all are going to have a wonderful time. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.